the legal profession. Co-president of RAP, Lowry Yankwich, is a third year JD student at Harvard Law School. Before entering law school, Lowry worked for two years at the Environmental Defense Fund with a brief stint in Helsinki working for GEMIC, a consulting firm. Lowry completed his undergraduate studies at Stanford University with a bachelor's in history. He has played classical music all his life and is currently working on a podcast about J.S. Bach's Goldberg variations called 30 from 1. It's my pleasure to welcome Lowry Yankwich. Thank you so much, uh, Joanne, for having us and Bobby as well. Um, it is a real honor to get to uh, meet and work with the people at Mondo um, and to be increasingly plugged into the music community, um, especially for us students who are really just at the outset of our careers. Um, so we're really excited about this event today and our hope is that uh, in the course of this event we can give sort of a whirlwind uh, introduction to music law um, covering a lot of different topics. So uh, our hope is that you'll follow along with us and uh, engage with us now and also after, um, after this presentation. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the rest of the, the people on the RAP board who are pictured up on the screen. Um, we have a great board of um, really dedicated students who are committed both to providing legal services to musicians uh, in the Boston area and around the country, um, and who are, are also really interested in uh, bringing change in the music industry to benefit uh, artists and creators. Um, with that, I also want to thank Brian Price, who is our um, supervising, uh, our faculty advisor for RAP, who has just been a constant font of uh, information and support. Um, Brian is a, a, a very experienced lawyer, both in community legal services um, and entertainment law, and he's represented clients, uh, Grammy award-winning artists, producers, songwriters, and indie labels. So he is truly um, an amazing resource for us to be able to work with. Um, so now I want to turn to um, sort of the material that we want to cover. And where I want to start is actually with Chris. Um, so Chris, you know, let's talk a little bit about the basics of, of copyright um, in music. So can you describe just, you know, what, what are we talking about when we're talking about copyright? Absolutely. Thanks, Larry, and hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here today, and I hope that we'll be able to just dive right on into some helpful content for you. So, of course, copyright is the most important way in which artists are able to protect their music, um, both from infringing and from potentially being subject to an infringement suit. Um, in the United States, copyright is governed by mainly two laws, the Copyright Act of 1909. This covers any works that were created before January 1st of 1978. Um, so if you're covering or sampling any songs before that year, it's covered under the 1909 legislation. And then there's the Copyright Act of 1976, which covers all works after January 1st, 1978. The line that is perhaps most important is that between what is protected under copyright and what has entered the public domain. Public domain means that this is content that does not have a current copyright claim over it. It's free to use to create derivative works and et cetera. Uh, so generally the rule of thumb for the public domain is that works that were created in or before the year 1922 are in the public domain, or songs that are created between 1923 and 1964, uh, where the copyright owner has not renewed their registration, are also in the public domain. It's actually pretty tricky to figure out the differences between what is in the public domain when it is um, a sound recording, when it is a video, when it is a piece of music. So it's always really important to check what the status of public domain or copyright registration is for any work that you are looking at using or creating. The best place to do this is probably the link that's currently displayed on the slide on the screen here. Um, it's with the Cornell University Copyright Information Center and it is updated every year with the newest rules on what has entered the public domain and what has not with a really helpful chart. So make sure to check that out because sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. Um, so now we can move on to the different types of copyright. Uh, we have composition, 
which entails the music and the lyrics. And then we also have a second type of copyright, which is the sound recording. That's the actual fixed recording, like a disc or a phono record. Um, so to give an example, back in 2010, um, many of you might remember always hearing CeeLo Green's song, Forget You, on the radio. That song was actually written um, by Bruno Mars. So in this case, Bruno Mars, or likely the publisher that he works with, is going to hold the copyright for the composition, whereas CeeLo Green is going to, or his record label, is going to have the copyright on the sound recording. Um, of course, this is complicated because it depends a lot on what deals are made with who gets to hold what rights. Um, that's really what the industry is all about between record labels and publishers. Um, but generally, it's just important to know that copyright is split among those two domains. Uh, the Copyright Act actually grants exclusive rights to copyright owners. And that means that you as the owner has the sole right um, to do a set of things unless you transfer those rights via a process called assignment or you give permission. And that's generally what you see with things like licensing. So to go through the list of these exclusive rights, you have reproduction, which means that you can't, nobody can make copies of your music or your work without your permission. Um, you have the exclusive right to create derivative works. That means things like sampling, remixes, parodies, movie rights, book rights. You also have the exclusive right of distribution, selling, leasing, lending the work publicly. Public performance rights, which is controlling how and when the work is performed publicly, things like concerts. Uh, public display, those are things like lyrics, um, guitar tabs, or sheet music. And then finally, digital transmission. And this applies to sound recordings where you can control the interactive digital transmissions during streaming or digital downloads. Think of that as something like Spotify rights. So Chris, uh, just a basic question here. How can you actually register your copyright? And uh, there's one registrant who asked actually, is there any way to streamline copyright registration? Because I think some people sometimes view it as sort of cumbersome. That's a really great question. So luckily now uh, registration is made a little bit easier because it's basically all done online. Um, but before we even get into how, I think it's just a great reminder that you should register, register, register. It's the best protection you have against disputes um, if it gets to that level, meaning that in litigation, you can seek attorney's fees and statutory damages. Um, statutory damages are damages that are awarded by law. So the Copyright Act actually allows for some no less than $750 and no more than $30,000 um, as per infringement as a fine that the court deems just. Uh, and registration is also a prerequisite to federal courts um, if you want to go there for litigation. So it's extremely important to register if you can. Um, so how to do that, you can go on to eco.copyright.gov um, or search up copyright uh, registration on Google. Um, and you will fill out a form online. You'll upload a copy of your work, in this case, probably a media or music file. And then you're going to pay online and it accepts most major forms of online transactions. Uh, in terms of fees for a single application, basically meaning you have a single owner, a single claimant of the copyright, it's only one work and it's not a work for hire, you pay $45 in order to register. If it's a different, um, if it doesn't follow those criteria exactly and it's a standard filing, then there's $65. Now there's uh, other rules for if your publishing works as a collective whole. So of course you might be wishing to register an entire anthology of published works or maybe an album of new work that you've been working on. So if you're doing an album of music that's already been published, you use the standard application fee. So that's $65 for the album. But if you're registering a full album of unpublished works, of new music that has not been uh, copyrighted, has not been published yet, then you don't use the standard application. You actually have to use the form titled Group of Unpublished Works, which is $85. In terms of streamlining this process, there hasn't been a ton of movement. Um, more of the important progress, I think, has actually been made in streamlining licensing. So allowing you to receive your royalties and, and navigate um, the process between publishers and record labels in a quicker manner. Um, two of the ways that the industry is currently changing and adapting is one-stop licensing, where a lot of artists are um, creating uh, ways where they, return, they retain their rights in composition and in publishing. Um, so that way you only need to go to one party in order to get both of those, again, composition and sound recording copyrights. Um, and the other one is using blockchain metadata in order to do automated licensing. Um, but that's a whole other presentation we can get into more if somebody asks a question on that. 
Thank you so much, Chris. I want to follow up on a couple things in the chat. First of all, uh, thank you to Aurelia Schultz for uh, posting some information as we're talking. That's really helpful. Um, I also wanted to follow up. Someone asked, is registering the same, registering a copyright the same thing as registering with your PRO? Um, Chris, do you have an answer for that? Sure. So those are different things. The copyright is governed by the U.S. Copyright Office, which is part of the government. And then PROs are private organizations that actually only deal with rights of public performance and licensing. So you should really register with both. Registering with the Copyright Office, again, protects you if you get into a dispute. It allows you to get into federal courts and receive certain different damages. Uh, and then registering with a PRO allows you to collect royalties from public performances, um, which these organizations help track, like when restaurants or bars will play your music um, for their patrons, you will get royalties for those once you register. And yeah, and this is a topic that we'll cover a little more later also. Um, I see there are questions popping up uh, and hopefully we'll be able to address those in subsequent parts of the discussion. But for now, I wanna turn to um, licensing. Um, so a number of registrants wanted to know sort of what the difference is between a compulsory license and a non-compulsory license, because those are things that have been thrown about um, that people might have heard of but not have a clear understanding of. Right, it's a great question. So uh, there are two different types of licenses, as this question suggests. There's compulsory licenses, which are kind of your exceptions to the exclusive rights that we discussed previously that you have if you register a copyright. It means if you don't get a compulsory license, you need to get a voluntary license from the usually sound recording owner. A compulsory license means you have to grant it to the person that is applying for it. You're not allowed to deny permission. And there are two compulsory licenses that exist. The first one is in digital performance of records, meaning that you have to allow for public digital performance, meaning things like satellite radio. And the second, um, perhaps more important uh, uh, compulsory license is mechanical licenses. So once a song is recorded and released publicly, the copyright owner has to license to anyone who wants to use it in a phono record. And that is for a fee, you receive the royalties and that's actually a fee that's established by law. And the owner has to grant that um, with few exceptions. Where you probably see this most is if any of you are cover artists, um, you are allowed to make a cover of any song that has been published and released publicly because the artist has to grant you a compulsory mechanical license. So actually covering and, and then a separate topic, sampling are often paired together. So maybe we can talk a little bit about sampling. Um, so, you know, there may be times that you want to work off of someone else's music, um, if, even if it's a short bit of it. So can you explain sort of legal uh, what what sampling is about, um, how it's legally distinct. Absolutely, and I, I saw a comment that I'm talking really fast, so I'll try to slow it down. Um, I'm sorry to try to get through this content <laughs> too quickly, um, but feel free to keep asking those questions. We're loving them and we'll make sure to, to re repeat as you need it. Um, sampling is so important. It's the you know building block from which so many different genres of music are made, but I've also heard from a lot of artists that I've worked with that it can be something kind of scary and limiting because you're trying to navigate licensing and copyright. So um, to give just an example of sampling for those of you who don't know it, sampling is where you use a song's music or its lyrics inside of a new work. Um, and it can be for a whole different host of reasons. You're trying to create a derivative work, you're trying to build on it, you're trying to reference something to uh, reflect the meaning of your song. So we're actually going to take a look at an example, um, a very famous example of sampling um, that many of you will probably recognize. And it is a clip first from Daft Punk for their song, Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger, followed immediately by a clip from Kanye West's Stronger. So uh, if Paul could go ahead and cue those clips up, that would be great. Paul, I think uh, you might be muted. Mute myself. Okay, there you go. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. We'll follow 
this up with the second one. Make it do it. Make sense. Honor, better, faster, stronger. Now, 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 that, that, that don't kill me. Can only make me stronger. I need you to hurry up now. Because I can't wait much longer. So uh, I'm glad to see a lot of people recognize those two classic clips. You can hear that the Daft Punk original clip from Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger is kind of um, muffled, modulated a little bit, and then used as the backtrack um, that Kanye goes and raps over. So this is a really cool example of sampling. Uh, and we're going to get a little bit now into how you can do this awesome technique, um, but do it legally and limit liability on that. So. Um, to start, when you use a song's music or lyrics, somebody else's um, work there, you need to get a license from the owner of the sound recording if you use the music. And again, that's usually the record company or the owner of the musical composition, again, usually the publisher. So uh, the best way to start is if you're thinking about it, you have a song that you really love and you want to sample, first, go ahead and look up what those licenses, um, what those rights holders are. So in my opinion, the best way to do this is start with the websites of performing rights organization databases. Again, Lowry is going to talk more about what PROs are, but they all have websites with publicly available databases of their catalogs. Look at, for instance, ASCAP or BMI, and then you can go through the catalog. Once you find the song, you're going to actually have information about the record companies, about the publishers, and those are people that you can start contacting to look at licensing fees, um, and you're going to be able to negotiate with them. There are not um, set fees on those. Anytime you substantially alter, mix, mash up, or otherwise change somebody else's song, you're making what's called a derivative work and a license is required. The only time when you can use a license where uh, you don't get authorization for that use is if it qualifies for protection called fair use. So fair use um, is basically a doctrine that shows that you need to either uh, do a use of a work that is substantially transformative or it qualifies with a certain type of use, meaning educational, criticism, commentary, or news reporting. So as a possible example of that, even though this hasn't been litigated in court, um, Weird Al is a very famous uh, musician who creates parodies of songs um, like taking Queen's Another One Bites the Dust and turning it into a song called Another One Rides the Bus. Um, so parody is something that is generally covered under fair use. So Weird Al's use probably qualifies um, under fair use and he doesn't have to get a license for that. However, it's important to note that Weird Al actually gets permission from every single one of the artists that he parodies. Um, and part of that is out of respect and another part of that is just preventing misunderstandings, possible accusations of copyright infringement. So remember, it's always good to err on the safe side, get that permission. Again, once you're entering into those negotiations, you can either have an upfront fixed price um, you can negotiate so that different parts or all of the copyright in your new song will go to the original. Um, and sometimes you can also do things called post hoc royalties, which is where the um, alleged infringement has already happened. And then the parties can come to a consensus on uh, royalties that are back paid. Um, an example of that is what happened with Vanilla Ice and Queen and David Bowie's Under Pressure when he used um, that backing track for Ice Ice Baby. Uh, and then they ended up settling on songwriting credits and then getting royalties paid back after the case. You don't always have to settle um, or groups won't always settle with you, but it's generally considered good business acumen to lead to the settlement so as not to rock the money train. Um, and yeah, that generally covers sampling. I think one other thing that's really important to note um, is that especially when we see sampling, we see that the music industry confronts a lot of inequities in the way that the court handles it and the way that the law handles people's ability to sample. Um, and primarily that comes across um, on lines of race, on lines that are drawn where some people are allowed to infringe and have that music written as, um, you know, a mashup DJ and a mastermind of di mixing different tracks, whereas some other people making mashups, um, for instance, since in 2007, a uh, black DJ who created mixtapes in Atlanta was arrested and fully prosecuted. Um, so when we see these inconsistencies in sampling, it allows us to ask a lot of questions of what we can do to change that by changing who is involved in the legal and music industries and making sure that the cases that we are creating are equally enforced. Um, and there's still a lot of work to be done in that, but those conversations are important. So we want to bring that up, especially as it pertains to sampling. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, I think that is a really important thing to bring up. 
Um, just in the interest of kind of moving forward, I want to talk, um, you know, just synthesize a little bit what we've just been talking about. So, um, you know, if you were talking to someone about copyright, what are the most important things you would want someone to remember to sort of properly protect their own copyrights and respect the copyrights of others? Absolutely. So I think the most important things to remember are, first off, register, register, register. If you can, um, again, go onto the website and even just take a look at the forms, see what it takes in order to get there. You don't need a lawyer to register. Um, it's always important to have that as extra protection. The second thing is make sure you're licensing just because uh, you're not profiting off of something, like you're not monetizing a video that you put up on YouTube, or you write a little note that says, um, all rights to the original creator, I don't own this content. Um, contrary to maybe popular belief, those are not things that allow you to willfully infringe, you're still infringing. So it's always important to make sure you're checking on proper permission, proper licensing, proper registration. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is that some people believe that there's a, a process that works called poor man's copyright, for lack of a better term. And that's where you can mail or email yourself a copy with a digital timestamp or deposit a copy of the work that you want to copyright with the bank um, and do that instead of registering with the copyright office. This is really risky and not generally effective because the courts see this as um, evidence that's really easy to fake, so they don't trust it. So again, the most important thing is try to just go through those channels um, of, of registering, protecting, and making sure you're approaching who you need to approach in order to license things. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, I want to turn now to talking about a different topic. And so for this, I'm going to be talking to a Neil. Um, and what I want to talk about is agreements, um, the agreements that people form between bands um, and composers for a piece of music. So um, Anil, if you're there, um, yeah, you know, making agreements, it may not be the first thing that people think about uh, when collaborating with other musicians, but can you talk a bit about why you might want to form a band agreement when you're working with others? Absolutely. I mean, music is so collaborative. I think oftentimes uh, predicting negative or nightmarish legal outcomes is probably the farthest thing from people's minds in, in moments of creativity, but uh, having and drafting a few very simple agreements at the outset of a creative venture can really protect you. Uh, at the end of the day, bands often function like businesses and disputes may happen. So just for example, here's, here's one nightmarish scenario. Uh, a leaving band member could attempt to stop you from operating under the band name, um, could demand royalties based on co-written works when that is determined to be inappropriate by the band, could withdraw money from the bank account. Uh, situations like this are helpful to predict. A good example, uh, Pink Floyd, when they broke up, Roger Waters and David Gilmour entered into a protracted legal battle over the use of the Pink Floyd name, uh, which went on for a while. Uh, so these, you know, these all might be fair and appropriate outcomes, but it's helpful to get down in writing what you want for purposes of stability, predictability, uh, and it allows your creativity to be more unfettered in that way. So there are a few main considerations that you might want uh, to keep in mind when you're reaching a band agreement. Um, one bucket is sort of what Chris has talked about, ownership concerns. Spell out who owns copyright and various uh, works uh, in the master recordings, who owns them, who owns the compositions, who owns the band name, is that joint? Um, there's another bucket of decision-making concerns. So bands are collaborative entities, but uh, it might be useful to spell out that no one band member can enter into contracts or agreements on their own on behalf of the band um, without prior knowledge and consent of other members. Um, it might be useful to spell out that decisions affecting the band require a majority vote among members. Um, otherwise, you can get into situations where work that you think uh, is heading in one direction or markets that you are anticipating entering into or tours that you're thinking of scheduling, um, you're unable perhaps to predict what might happen. Um, and I think reaching agreements with individual members is very useful in those circumstances. Finance is something that, that is probably at the very back of your mind, uh, at least it often was for me as a musician. Um, but, you know, for example, if a band member loans the band money for recording, um, are they is there a tacit understanding that they're going to acquire some interest in the sound recording or something else? Um, if there are individual ex 
expenses, uh, you might credit those to the band as an entity, uh, say equipment, right? Uh, on the basis of touring profits, whatever else. If that happens, do you own that cherished guitar or that drum kit that you love uh, based on that that was acquired? So these are all things that, you know, it's up to you which considerations you want to put into such an agreement. Uh, this is just sort of a few buckets that you might want to think about. Um, it's important always to get independent advice on agreements like this that you reach. And it's very important to have good boilerplate clauses. Um, that's perhaps beyond the scope of, of this talk, but uh, either through us, through, through our intake process and pro bono services we deliver, or through independent advice from another lawyer, um, uh, it helps to predict, anticipate, and plan for certain circumstances like this. Um, yeah. Contingencies may arise, you know, individual band members might want to perform and do side projects outside of the main, main group. Uh, or if a member leaves, they might think they're entitled to, to certain uh, rights uh, and privileges that you might not have expected. So were you going to ask me a question, Lowry? Sorry. I, um, I was just going to jump in and I wanted to um, anticipate something that people might be thinking, which is, um, you know, what is, is there a, an exact format or, you know, I guess my, my sense is that for band agreements, anything is better than uh, yeah. an oral agreement or so your there's no template because but, yeah you know the nature of your project is going to be different person to person I mean there might be one sort of sole creative architect uh, and everyone might agree to uh, you know them owning all the copyright uh, financing all kinds of projects uh, there might be one individual band member that everyone understands to be responsible for accounting duties or but it just helps to clarify your understandings as a group because while it, it might not be pleasant to think about, um, you know, conflicts just can arise. Um, and I think this relates to and justifies some of the other agreements that um, I'd hope to discuss, the work for hire agreements, assignment agreements, and split sheets. Um, yeah, well, let's, so let's turn to work for hire agreements. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, when those come up? I mean, a, a lot of musicians have, have seen work for hire agreements, but uh, describe it a little bit. Yeah, so just to, to motivate, I did a little bit of session music work myself, and I saw one of these things. Um, and I think it would have been very helpful for the parties involved because uh, if you can do a uh, composition in some way, you write a song, you do something else like this that contributes to an arrangement, you are a joint author of that work. That is the default rule in the copyright regime. And so you do not reach a work for hire agreement um, you can have people asserting all kinds of claims in the content that, again, you might not have predicted, relied on a tacit understanding. These work for hire agreements, um, they're, they exist in co-authorship and contribution contexts. They're commonly used in an employment context by groups like Microsoft and other software designers. The operating system is owned by Microsoft or Apple. Everyone else worked as an employee and their work is as an employee for the, the larger entity. In the composition context, to be clear, work for hire agreements are contracts in which contributors agree that the work that they perform with or for another person is done as either an employee or an independent contractor. Uh, to truly be an employee that requires uh, you know, a, a true employment relationship that might be a salaried uh, employment relationship that's ongoing. Perhaps an example might be a producer working for a record label uh, on a salary. Um, uh, but in the composition context, you know, if you get help from a friend with a bridge in a particular song of yours, they might well have made a material contribution to the song that is in itself copyrightable. So with a signed work for hire agreement, you can retain a sole undivided copyright interest in the work. If you don't, they have co-equal ownership with all the associated rights. They could transfer their share in the composition. They could grant third parties non-exclusive licenses. Um, work for hires are provided for statutorily in the US Copyright Act of 1976, section 101. Um, the relevant section here is likely for you not the employer or employee relationship, but the independent contractor relationship. So. That might be a case in which you commission someone's help for a particular purpose, a one-off contribution to a song, et cetera. Important to stress, you need a written agreement if they're not a true employee, for example, a salaried one. Uh, and even if it might seem like an employment relationship, it seems like it would probably be good practice 
to just reach a written agreement, partly for the reasons I mentioned with end agreement, predictability, stability, certainty. Um, for sound recordings, separate bucket. For sound recordings, you don't do a work for hire because that is not provided for by the statute. Instead, you would do an assignment agreement, which has a similar effect. But what it means is they're assigning you any copyright interest that they would come to get in working on the sound recording and contributing to it to you. Um, uh, this probably co will come up more often, I would imagine, um, you know, in a session music context, if a player plays a guitar part, a drum part, contributes backing vocals, all of those contributions establish a copyright interest in the sound recording. So without an assignment agreement, you have multiple joint owners, joint authors, um, and that might be a circumstance that you're interested in avoiding. Um, sorry, you're, you might been here. I just want to sure. um, bring up something from the chat. I, I don't know if you uh, know this, but um, someone asked, is, uh, is the work for hire something that you can do after the fact? So uh, I, I would imagine that an assignment agreement is more appropriate after the fact, because after the work has been done, um, they would already have the, the, uh, they already have a copyright interest in the work. And so they would just be assigning you that copyright interest in the work, but it's possible that courts would honor a retroactive work for hire agreement. I know they honor retroactive licenses in the copyright contract context uh, and covenants not to sue on the basis of past infringements. So it's possible they would do a retroactive thing, but you could achieve the same effect, I think, with an assignment agreement. I don't know if Brian has um, insight on that. That's, Actually, that's if right. Brian... um, typically, oh, yeah. typically it would be an assignment. Um, work for hires uh, ordinarily are, are things that are done in advance, although the practical effect is pretty much the same, except with, um, with assignments, there's the right to terminate the assignment, which is a reason, for example, why many record companies have preferred their contracts to be called work for hires, even though Technically, as Anil brought out, there's no such thing under the under the Copyright Act for sound recordings. Um, but you know, with the termination of assignment, it simply means after, I believe it's like 35 years or so, you can give you you can terminate an assignment, and you have like a seven-year run-up of providing notice to a, a label that you're going to terminate your assignment. And that means the, the copyright reverts back to the original owner, which is something that labels don't really want to see. So um, it's a technical distinction. Um, you know, later on in years, practically speaking, in the in the early going, it's it's pretty much the same for everyone involved. Uh, it's I wanted to address one thing in the chat which someone asked, uh, can a co-writer issue non-exclusive license of licenses on their own? Yes, a joint author of a work can issue non-exclusive licenses in the work. And that might actually be something that you wanna prevent as a, as a joint author. I mean, you might not be wanting someone to license work for particular uses, uh, a television commercial. Um, I don't know what the case might be, but uh, just the value of these agreements is to make everyone's relationships understood at the time, uh, I would say. Um, a good example, of assignment instead of work for hire, I had written up here. I don't know how good it is. So Wayne Shorter writes a jazz composition, say, and session players track their parts without any assignment agreements in place. They now can license samples, collect royalties on the basis of the, the sound recording because they each have a right to enjoy all the rights of the sound recording. Now, you might not want that. Maybe Wayne Shorter does not want his song to be sampled by particular artists. So, uh, just for the interest of predictability and stability, I would recommend uh, uh, reaching these agreements. And so a related uh, agreement is a split sheet. Um, it's a simple idea. You just divide up copyright in a composition or sound recording. Uh, it's again, very useful in co-authorship contexts when it's, but particularly when it's desirable for multiple parties to have and keep rights in the content. So for example, a bunch of co-equal major contributors who uh, share an understanding that they're each going to be able to exploit rights in it, uh, collaborations between multiple independent artists in their own right. Um, it's a good idea to write a split sheet, I would say, for every song that you write or co-write 
also lyric sheets and other related documents, which I'm sure others can discuss. Um, uh, and so just what they, what they can include, because this is a little more formulaic than a band agreement. Um, it's important that they include the parties, so the legal name and contact information um, of these parties, names, addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, uh, the contribution they made, the performing rights organization that they're affiliated with, uh, something called their interested party identifier number, which I'm sure many of you are even more familiar with than I am, a unique number assigned to you by your PR, as well as, very importantly, your ownership percentage in, in uh, the product. Uh, there are plenty of form split sheets available online, as well as work for hire agreements um, and assignment agreements. That being said, um, and a split sheet, as what I understand, would, that's done post hoc after the fact, would have the effect of an assignment agreement in the same kind of way. I don't know if that is, if there would need to be very explicit language assigning the rights in the work that you had just done to the other party, but. Um, yeah, let me, and let me jump in to one second too. There are some very established writers who don't even start a session until a split sheet's already been done uh, because they don't wanna get into the mess after the fact of trying to figure out who owns what percentage. Um, typically, many writers nowadays, though, will just do the session, vibe off the creativity, and then try to wrestle with doing a split sheet after the fact, um, which can become a very messy situation. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes records even get released without even there having been a split sheet. Just the, the label may figure, oh, they'll work it out. They'll figure it out later. Everybody wants this record to get out there. Um, and that's a messy situation, too. Um, one other thing I just want to mention about the uh, question that was asked about um, joint owners, joint authors having the right to grant non-exclusive licenses. Uh, keep in mind that anytime a record gets released for the first time, the, the first can only happen once. So the first is an exclusive right. So in order for a record to get released for the first time, all the joint authors have to agree to that. Um, after the fact, you know, for, for subsequent licenses, uh, by default, any of the joint authors can do a non-exclusive license, but oftentimes uh, the party on the other side doesn't want to take a chance that there may be uh, some internal dispute that they're not aware of. So typically, they still have all they still want all the joint authors to sign that particular license agreement as a practical matter. Brian, while we still have you uh, right in front of us. A lot of people asked in um, registering for this talk about common pitfalls in contracts. Um, you know, do you have any advice for for reading a contract um, in a in a general sense to you know try to sniff out if it if it looks okay if it if it's mm -hmm. fair? Well, um, you know, every contract has provisions which mean something. So I can't say that there's common pitfalls because the, the, the biggest pitfall is not knowing what you sign. That's the biggest pitfall. And taken for granted, if somebody on the other side uh, tells you that the contract says X, Y, and Z, that you take their word for it. Um, and there may be words in the contract that contradict what the person on the other side may have told you orally. Believe what your eyes tell you. Um, and so, you know, with every contract, there are provisions that, um, because of your circumstances, you may agree with, and they, and they may be worse provisions than somebody else would accept who has more leverage in dealing with the contract. So, you know, every contract is going to grant rights, maybe master ownership rights, maybe master license rights, maybe a term of, of contract. Uh, maybe a release commitment, you know, commitment to release the record in, in such and such a time frame. Um, maybe rights to, that the label has to defer release. A uh, certain amount of money that you're going to get in a recording budget or in an advance. Certain parts are recoupable. You know, everything is negotiable. Um, and everything nowadays, really, is, in my estimation, even though a label may say this is standard, nothing standard. Um, you know, people may want you to think that nothing's negotiable and it's take it or leave it, but everything ha has variables and it all depends on the leverage. 
So the biggest pitfall is not knowing what your contract says and not knowing what it is you'll accept. A contract really is just a reflection of a business deal. That's what it is. And if you're willing to accept the business deal and come to an agreement with the other party, uh, then you're fine. If you don't, if you don't know what you're signing, then that's a big pitfall. Be fastidious. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now I think we're going to move on. Thank you so much, Anil uh, and Brian, for for commenting in that section. Um, this last set, last section, I'm actually going to turn it over to Chris to be asking the questions, um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, earning money as a musician, uh, whether as a songwriter or as a recording artist. Great to be back. Uh, thanks so much, Lowry, for leading us through this. And now it's going to be great to ask you some questions, um, primarily around how songwriters can generate income. I know that both before the pandemic and especially now, musicians want to know about how to generate income from their art. Um, could you start us off with a discussion on how songwriters are navigating the different organizations that handle things like royalties and licensing? Sure. So at this time, I'd like to bring up a chart, um, I think, uh, that might be a little bit helpful to, to look at as we're talking about this. Um, so just to reiterate, um, talk, um, Chris talked about this at the beginning, but there are separate copyrights in the composition and also in the sound recording. So in this first part, I'm just talking about the um, right in the composition. So Songwriters have a, a number of different exclusive rights uh, stemming from their composition. And one of the most important of those is a public performance right. So every time that your composition is performed in public, whether it's on the radio or in a restaurant or at a gym, um, you're entitled to royalties. And there are um, PROs, performing rights organizations, that have been established by musicians to facilitate the collection of these performance royalties. Um, so there are three, well, actually there are four um, PROs in the US, um, two of which are by invitation only, but um, there's BMI and ASCAP, which are open to anyone. Um, and you can only be part of one PRO uh, at a time. So it's important to do, do research when you're looking into joining a PRO. But these PROs um, essentially help gather royalties um, stemming from public performances. And one of the things I was just looking at the different um, venues from which they collect performance royalties. And it's truly amazing. I mean. They're collecting royalties from um, online radio, so Pandora or also Spotify, from Netflix, Amazon, also from background services that maybe restaurants use um, just for background music to set the mood. Uh, they're collecting from colleges, from, um, from bars, from roller rinks, from circuses. So really um, many, many places that you're seeing music performed um, these PROs are involved in collecting royalties for that, um, those performances. And they do that by forming um, agreements with these uh, institutions that want to play these, um, these compositions in their spaces. Uh, and so they issue blanket licenses. Um, and so if you are using a PRO, um, which you should be if you're a composer, um, you need to register your songs. So this is where um, it makes sense a little bit to talk about having a publisher or self-publishing. So um, normally if, if you're in contract with a publisher, the publisher will take care of um, registering your songs with the PRO. Um, but there may also be good reasons to either self-publish um, or to use a publishing administrator, which is not quite at the level of a publisher, but can help you do a lot of the registration um, that is important for collecting royalties. Um, just briefly, one reason that you might want to self-publish is because uh, publishers typically split royalties with the composer. So um, if you do self-publish, then you can um, get a larger share of the royalties um, from your compositions. 
On the other hand, um, publishers are really useful when it comes to getting your works out there and licensing your works. So you'll have to sort of balance thinking about um, the, the pros and cons of seeking out a publisher versus self-publishing. And then that intermediate zone is um, a, publishing, a publishing administrator, which is a service that will not take as large a cut of royalties, but can help you with a lot of the administrative work uh, and, and registration work that goes into collecting them. Um, so I guess just when it comes to PROs, my main advice is it's really important to register your songs on PROs, um, whether through a publisher or individually. Um, and they can be a, a major source of revenue for songwriters. Um, the one other thing I wanna mention is that not all the royalties uh, come for, for songs actually come through PR. So you can also get income from direct licensing. I know people in the chat have asked a little bit about sync licensing, um, which is for when you want to, when someone wants to match a composition uh, and song with a video work, um, like a movie or a TV show. Um, and what's nice about sync licenses is that they're actually negotiated separately each time. So if you're the songwriter, um, it gives you a lot of power to, to set the terms and sync licenses can be a major source of revenue um, for songwriters. Um, and then the final, the final thing to talk about is mechanical licensing, which um, Chris touched on. But so mechanical licenses are how you give others permission to make your songs uh, into a sound recording um, and to make copies of that recording. So the, there are publishers who will handle mechanical licensing, but also the Harry Fox Agency is an intermediary that handles uh, mechanical licensing. So it's worth going to the Harry Fox Agency website and registering with them as well. Um, so just to summarize kind of what I've been talking about, um, PROs collect and distribute performance royalties and are a major source for songwriters. Um, and the Harry Fox Agency and also some publishers collect and distribute mechanical royalties. Um, and then there are other royalties, or sorry, there are other licenses that you can get from your sound recording, like sync licenses that can be other sources of income. Larry, that was great. I understand that because there's separate copyrights that exist in the composition and in the sound recording, recording artists have different options for generating income. Can you discuss those methods, especially maybe as they pertain to things like YouTube or Instagram Live, as a lot of artists are trying to create concerts and income in the pandemic? Sure. So, yeah, the the rights in a sound recording and in a composition are distinct. Um, so, so, for sound recordings, um, the let's see. So royalties. Um, normally people will contract with a record label um, and then the record label will sort of get the sound recording out there and then distribute um, royalties back to the artist. But in the absence of a recording label, there's also um, many distribution services that are extremely helpful for emerging artists to get their sound recordings out uh, into um, public spaces and to start collecting money from that. Um, so, these distribution services include examples like CD Baby, TuneCore, uh, and DistroKid. Um, and they are things that can help put your music on Apple Music, on Spotify, on TikTok, uh, Tidal, iHeartRadio, Instagram. Um, so they can really help with placing your music um, if you're not working with a record label. Um, one thing to note is that for digital streaming, there's actually a public performance right in digital transmissions, which is kind of a unique thing. Normally there's not a public performance right for sound recordings, um, but there is for digital transmission of sound recordings. So when um, companies like Sirius XM, so satellite radio or um, non-interactive webcasters like Pandora um, stream musical content, they're required to pay royalties um, for the sound recording. And those royalties go to a, a, an organization called Sound Exchange, which, which acts a lot like a PRO, but in the context of sound recordings. Um, so 
if you are a uh, recording artist, then you should also be signing up for Sound Exchange, um, just registering with Sound Exchange because you can actually start collecting royalties from things like satellite radio um, or Pandora other, uh, and other webcasters. As far as YouTube goes, um, YouTube does, uh, it, it is a little different. Um, YouTube actually does have contracts with record labels. So that can be a source of income if you're signed with a record label. But just as an individual, um, to start making money through YouTube, you need to reach a certain subscriber level um, or um, minutes watched level. So um, essentially to be able to monetize music that you put up on YouTube, you need to have a certain, um, you need, sort of need to meet a threshold level of viewership so that they can start to push ads into your videos, um, which helps you monetize them. Um, so you don't automatically make money from YouTube, but you can. Um, and they actually have a lot of really good tools available on YouTube to help you sort of develop your channel um, and start making uh, money from YouTube. Um, but YouTube is notoriously not um, a great source of actual income, um, but it can be a really good way to get yourself out there, as probably many of you guys know. Thanks, Lowry. So finally, I've been alluding a lot to working during COVID and throughout our discussion, a lot of registrants um, have also been talking about how they can continue to, to create and make money during this time. Um, I understand recent legislation was passed to give some extra unemployment funds that musicians might be able to tap into. Uh, could you talk about those benefits and, and how we can access them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this pandemic is, is particularly hard for musicians um, and I, I feel the pain. I'm really, uh, I'm, yeah, anyway, but um, so recent federal legislation has for the first time given um, unemployment benefits, made them available for freelancers. Um, so a lot of musicians are working as freelancers and collecting income through 1099 forms instead of traditional W-2 forms. And so for the first time, this legislation allows for um, people to apply for uninsurance, uh, sorry, unemployment insurance um, benefits, even as freelancers. And that program is called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Then adi in addition to that program, there's also the Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, not to uh, confuse people too much, um, but that is for people who are either freelancers or collecting traditional unemployment benefits. Um, and that adds an extra $600 per week in benefits for uh, people through the end of July. Um, so one major problem that I've read about so far and heard, heard about talking to people is if you're someone who has a hybrid income where some of your income is through um, traditional empl employment where you're getting a W-2 form, um, and then some of it is from freelancing and 1099 forms, you can get into a situation where um, you have to apply for unemployment um, through the traditional system. Um, but then what you receive in unemployment is based entirely on what you collect in W-2 forms. So it's missing the income that you actually were generating um, through the 1099 freelance work. And that's a problem that a lot of people have been talking about recently. Um, the only silver lining, I guess, is that whether or not you're on the um, freelance side of things or you're in the traditional unemployment benefits, you can still receive the $600 per week through the pandemic unemployment compensation program. Um, and just, I guess, one more detail is that these benefits are admi administered at the state level. So um, if you're looking for where to get these benefits, um, you need to be looking at your particular state's um, unemployment office. And I think just searching your state's name and then pandemic unemployment uh, assistance is probably a good place to start. Great. Uh, well, that that was a great primer through all of that. I, I'm sure a lot of different artists and our registrants are finding that really helpful. I, we do have a little bit of time, I think, to do some open Q and A. Um, I think we have been trying to process a lot of the questions you've been <laughs> sending, both in the chat and also privately to us. So we really apologize if we've missed a few, but some of them we've actually been tracking uh, and saving for this time. So I think Anil might have some questions that we've gathered from the chat that we might not have gotten to. 
Uh, Absolutely. To get to. Uh, so Kent is asking if we have a typical 50-50 sync license agreement that we could show or send uh, that's non-exclusive. I can answer that. Um, we don't have one on hand, um, but this is a good time to pitch the recording artist project. Um, so you, uh, you guys might want to write this down, but our email is hlsrap, uh, R-A-P, at gmail.com. Um, and if you email us uh, or connect with us online, um, we do regular client intake and do this kind of advising and, and sharing templates all the time. So just get in touch with us and, and hopefully we can get you the materials that you need. Uh, there was another question. Um, clarify the difference, please, between registering with a PRO and registering your copyright. Do you need to register your copyright if you're already registered with a PRO? I can take that one. Uh, so again, those are slightly different things. Registering for your copyright is allowing yourself to um, have protection if there are disputes in litigation, allowing different access to fees um, and damages that are exchanged, whereas a PRO is an organization that helps collect royalties um, from the music that you are creating. So uh, in most cases, the best case scenario is make sure you register with both because one protects you from liability, the other one allows you to generate income. And I'm just going to add on because I also see someone asking, does label handle copyright registration? Um, so we were talking earlier about publishing administrators and also distribution services. So it's worth researching um, things like TuneCore um, or I think there, was, there are a few others that I, I can mention, but um, these distribution services and publishing administrators do help with both registration for PROs and with copyright registration. So um, they can simplify things. Yeah, Song Trust, someone is adding that. Thanks, that's a good recommendation. Uh, I just want to also say something about the um, copyright registration. So the, the Music Modernization Act um, has a, a requirement which will go into effect uh, sometime down the road, which will enable uh, writers, uh, owners of, of publishing interests and, and recordings to collect their streaming revenue uh, more thoroughly. Uh, one of the one of the requirements for that would be copyright registration. There'll be like a, a building a massive database of the works that are getting streamed. And, um, you know, right now, many people are not getting paid all the income because uh, streaming services may claim they don't know who owns the song or they don't know who owns the record, even though they're playing it. Uh, but in, in, some, in some time down the road, um, you'll be able to collect that revenue, but one of the stipulations is that you must be your copyright must be registered. So it's adding an incentive to get registered. Uh, I think this recent clarification question would be helpful uh, co regarding co-writers' right to license on a non-exclusive basis for a joint author. Does that apply to commercials, film, TV, video games? What was the question right now? So for joint authors, for co-writers, they have a right to license on a non-exclusive basis, grant a non-exclusive license, technically. Does that apply to commercials, film and TV, video games? That's what the, the question was. Yeah. Um, you know, anyone who has a copyright interest has the right to license non-exclusively. However, as was mentioned before, uh, very often the party on the other side wants to be 100% certain that it has all the permissions of anyone who owns that interest. So even though technically uh, one person can grant a non-exclusive license on behalf of everyone else, in practice, typically the other party wants to make sure that everyone who owns an interest does sign that license agreement. And, uh, in general, there have been requests about the information we've put out in this uh, presentation. Is it going to be available afterward? Uh, we may have slightly addressed that, but there's a particular question about uh, pre-1978 and post-1978 works, public domain works. Where can participants get this information? And will this session be available online after it ends? So in terms of uh, getting the information on pre versus post and, and what the rules are on that, uh, 
You can generally find that information again through either looking through the US copyright database, looking through PROs, um, registrations on who the publishers and record labels are, as well as looking through that public domain website linked at the beginning again from uh, Cornell. You can also Google search public domain um, Cornell University and it'll come up with really helpful charts on navigating the complexities of, of what the status of a work is and what date it is at registered. Um, but if somebody else could jump in on, in terms of other slide materials and availability of this afterwards, that would be great. Yeah, I believe this will be uh, available afterwards uh, as a, um, yeah, just a recording of this session. So people should be able to review it and, and get a, any information that they need that we talked about. So with that, I think, um, you know, thank you guys so much for all of the different questions you've been asking. I'm sorry that we can't get to everything that um, people are asking, but please feel free to get in touch with us at hlsrap at gmail.com. Um, and we may also be holding a, another session um, this summer. We'll see how that goes. Um, but we really look forward to hearing from you and are so appreciative of the chance to get to um, talk with you all today. Handing it back to, to Joanne. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. So thanks to our wonderful panelists and a special thanks to Brian Harvard Law School and faculty advisor and supervising attorney at RAP. And thank you all for joining us today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you all very soon. Have a great evening. Bye-bye, everyone.